Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Adi and today we have a team report from the Vancouver Regional Championships and I am joined by your top four competitor. I'm joined by Michael. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing well. Uh, it's great to have you on again. Uh, and yeah, so for those who don't know you, for those who might have missed the last time you were on here, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Michael, uh, better known as Eternal Snowman Online or ESM. Um, I'm the Sacramento Regional Champion. Uh, I started competing in like 2019 uh, and really ramped it up starting like last season. Uh, so I qualified for Worlds last year and then won Sacramento top 32 at Portland and uh, top four at Vancouver. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you had... Uh... You had one of the uh, the coolest teams at the tournament this time, uh, and in fact, I think before the tournament we were driving up together, and you said that you might have cooked too hard this time, uh, but it <laughs> seemed to be just the right amount. Uh, so yeah, tell me about your uh, the team building process for this tournament and how you approached the uh, the lead up to this tournament. Yeah, um, I think after uh, with the the current system of the. Um, qualification system being that I had already gotten my invite basically in October. Um, it was always going to be the case that coming to these other tournaments that I was always going to go to like Portland and uh, Vancouver because they're close by for me just being in the Pacific Northwest. Um, because I, I was going to go to those tournaments anyway, um, I wanted to make sure that when I went to those tournaments that I had fun at those tournaments. So uh, all like the rest of the season after Sacramento has all been uh, playing with Pokemon that I like, playing with Pokemon that are more interesting and not conforming to the meta. And so um, no matter what was uh, I was actually going to run going into uh, Vancouver, it was definitely not going to be something standard. So um, the start of my process really was that I wanted to run... Um, I wanted to run uh, Gouging Fire with Baxcalibur, and a lot of that was built off. Uh, I really like playing with Howl, and uh, Gouging Fire is the best Howl mod we've ever had, like in VGC period, I want to say. Um, and it checks all the boxes. And so originally, I was running Gouging Fire with Baxcalibur, um, and this was even before um, like Luca had his run with King Gambit, and before Gouging Gambit really became a strong archetype. Um, and so when that first started, I thought the team was really, really strong. And then, uh, basically like I started prepping for some other things like for GC and like gouging, uh, gouging backs wasn't something that I was looking at for the GC because it did struggle a little bit in, uh, open or closed team sheet situations. But then, uh, when I came back to it, I, um, still really liked it and I thought I was going to bring it to, uh, Vancouver. And so I had, I worked, uh, like for quite a long time on it and then uh basically ended up on in the situation where against balanced teams that were starting to become more and more popular the team started to struggle a lot because uh there's a lot of 50 50s against urshifu against amoongus and incineroar together like it can be very annoying um and so i just thought um like one day i was just like you know what beats all of these como and like of course como is the pokemon that uh, uh, nowadays, like, I'm known for. Um, and Pokemon I'm the most comfortable using uh, with Iron Defense Body Press. And so uh, the only issue with Como is that it has some um, uh, major flaws in the current meta. And the number one most uh, glaring issue with Como is Landorus Eye. Uh, it doesn't have a great Landorus Eye matchup. Like, you can still do damage to it. It doesn't Oko you right back. But... It often has a very winning matchup, and a lot of teams that have Landorus Eye, by, like by itself, Landorus Eye can um, make it so that your combo uh, can't beat the standard core. So, like for example, if they bring Landorus Eye, Rillaboom, Incineroar, and Urshifu, even though the other three Pokemon hard lose to Como, uh, Landorus Eye alone can actually win that matchup. So, I need to change how I was approaching the uh, the team building process um and so i can't just rely on como to beat all the balance cores by itself and so then i uh like in parallel i guess i also had the idea of size spam I've, I've been a huge believer of size spam in since the beginning of the format um i've originally like before the when the new months first came out i thought iron crown was really really bad and 
uh, because of its bad Incineroar matchup and its more like more or less one-dimensional playstyle, it feels like it wasn't a good Pokemon. But then when I saw some teams that actually utilized it, it felt like it was a lot stronger in practice than I had thought it was on paper. And so after, like, leading up to Portland, it was never really, like, I never fleshed it out enough to want to use it. But, you know, uh, playing some of the teams in practice for Portland and then, like, during Portland, some of the teams that ended up doing well uh, made me really believe that Iron Crown and uh, Indeedy as a combo could be very, very strong. So I had tested it a little bit as well, but I felt that it was too clunky to play, uh, mostly because... Iron Crown has, uh, or the the previous version of the team with Iron Crown, Chiyu, and Urshifu Rapid Strike is a very hyper offensive team. It requires you to position your Iron Crown next to Tailwind alongside having Psychic Terrain down, and it just felt very very difficult to do in the current meta because um, you either have to uh, like you somehow need to get it so that Iron Crown is next to Tornadus, um, Tornadus, uh, NDD, and also in Pokemon that can threaten uh incineroar and also with current meta trends like for example av raging bolt it made it that so that like the team just didn't feel like it was uh trending in the right direction and so most players had actually completely dropped the team like by by the time like i want to say like utrecht came around or like um like a couple weeks back and so uh there was like almost no believers in the team and so size spam as a, as a whole had had gone down um and so while i was testing this gouging team i did run into the ladder on uh into this this specific set uh so i, I said this on tub takes earlier but i didn't actually come up with the iron crown set uh, i did steal it from somebody on ladder um you know i think audio you said maybe that it was chase but um oh yeah I know, yeah I know. i'm not sure i know i've seen the the combine set around on ladder too not just from you but uh, yeah, I don't know how common it was. Yeah, so like about a month ago, I want to say, I came up, came, met somebody on ladder, and I was like a little bit rage laddering <laughs> at the time. And so I thought, uh, and, and then I played it, and I just c got completely stomped. Like, um, you just click Calm Mind turn one, and Terra Psychic kicked and killed my Yao Jing from full. And so I thought, like, whatever. Like, at the time, I was thinking just like, whatever. Uh, I, I'm never going to play this in tournament. It's never, uh, it, that's like not serious. And so like I wrote it off and I was just like kept rage lettering or whatever. I just got tilted or whatever at that time. And so, uh, but then later, like a couple days later, I, I was just like thinking about it. And I was like, that does seem really, really strong, but it does have some issues. And so what is Iron Crown's biggest issues? Well, Rillaboom and Incineroar uh, are the two biggest ones. And then there's some other fringe ones, like for example, um, like you could say Pal, maybe like not really as much, but like Dark Urshifu and like some of these other Pokemon. But a lot of the issues that Iron Crown has, uh, Como actually addresses them very well because if you have to rely on your instant Rillaboom to deal with Iron Crown, then you have uh, Como in the back, and it can basically one before all the 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 those standard balance guys that uh, the glue balance pieces like. Insane, Rilla, uh, Ogre Pond, Amoongus, all of those guys get completely wiped by Como. Uh, doesn't matter how many of them you have, they all lose. So um, basically, the synergy is really good because um, Como has, like, the, the thing that it will struggle with is the faster offensive pieces like Landorus, which struggles with dealing with Iron Crown. Uh, and, like, for example, this Iron Crown set, if you Terra, then at plus one, you actually take two Earth powers from Landorus. Uh, or, if you want to put it this way, uh, it will take one Earth power at plus one uh, at without Terra. Um, and so, like, you can really out uh, out pressure like Iron Crowns, and then the two of them pair well together because if you Terra one uh, of your pieces to be able to protect them from uh, from one of the pieces, then it starts to um, make it so the other piece can beat them. So, like, a common example for this would be uh, Incineroar. If an Incineroar wants to tear a Ghost to protect itself from Como, then it's going to die to the ex uh, Expanding Force later into the game uh, from Iron Crown. And similarly, you can have uh, situations where, like, if they want to protect their, um, like, King Gambit uh, from Como with, like, a Terra Fairy or a Terra Dragon, 
that will uh, ma make it no longer immune to psychic. And then also similarly, like if they want to tear their wellspring to help them deal with Iron Crown, then that's going to make them now weak to uh, weaker to body press. It just means that they can't tear their instant or or whatever. Um, so the fundamental synergy is is there. And then uh, Hearth Flame was the the fourth piece of that core four Pokemon and. Um, the thing that I realized that was so strong about this team was that um, previously a lot of size spam teams relied on in DD. You either have your psychic terrain and follow me on the field at the same time, or you don't have follow me uh, support at all. And so having Hearth Flame next to Iron Crown means that even in matchups where, like against Rillaboom specifically, uh, first off, Hearth Flame deters Rillaboom pretty heavily just because the matchup into Rillaboom is very strong, but also because uh, Hearth Flame next to uh, Iron Crown means that you're both threatening damage, but also just like in bad matchups, you can just click follow me and then you can get the free Calm Mind up and you can bring in your NDD whenever you want. And so uh, it just allows you to have way more control in the terrain game because it allows you to get up the Calm Mind a lot easier next to your uh, follow me user instead of having to rely on both having the terrain and follow me on the same Pokemon. Um, and so the double redirection can uh, make it so that you can completely lock uh, people out of the game if it's a bad matchup for them. If they, like, uh, a common example that I played this weekend was, like, against Stun, uh, and their main damage dealer would be, like, Walking Wake, and, uh, or, or they could either use Walking Wake or Fluttermane, and uh, because Fluttermane's spread move is uh, going to be Fairy type, which doesn't do damage to Iron Crown. Um, they just can't win the game. Like it's just not possible for them to ever win the game because you just stick your redirector next to Iron Crown, you get up one call mine, and then you just one shot their entire team, and they just can't do anything. And like the matchup becomes like almost unwinnable for some of these teams um, because they just don't have any way uh, into the game. Um, and then the uh, so the, those core four I had figured out basically about like I want to say about a month before Vancouver. And um, I went through some uh, multiple iterations. I think uh, the first iteration included like uh, Arcanine Hisui with a Hydreigon. Um, I think, no, I think uh, at first it was like a Primarina or something like that. But regardless, uh, it went through multiple iterations. Uh, and then eventually uh, I landed back on Tyranitar. Uh, Tyranitar is also a Pokemon that I've been uh, using for almost like the last year. Uh, and Tyranitar, the reason why it's on this team uh, is because um, Tyranitar is like excellent at dealing with uh, fringe matchups, uh, while the core four Pokemon are really good at dealing with the, the standard balanced teams. Uh, whenever you play against these other teams that are still in the meta, but they're not as common, uh, for example, Hard Trick Room was, uh, was a common one, uh, Opposing Size Fam, uh, Torn Glim, Chi Yu teams. Uh, th those are the ones that Titar is great and excellent into because uh, it just has a lot of stats. So things that um, just want to, if you just want to throw a lot of stats at a problem, uh, Titar is excellent at that. It has uh, the most stats in of any Pokemon in the game right now because of Sandstream plus Assault Vest. Like the interaction means that it gets way more stat than uh, a normal Pokemon would. So like effectively. Like I, I like to say that Tyranitar is like effectively like a 700 base stat mine, uh, and you can say that like it's held back in certain ways by a lot of these other factors. Like it has a very bad typing, uh, or I guess I should say it's a more polarized typing. Uh, it has a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses in its type, um, but because it just has so much raw stat and power, uh, access to strong moves uh, with like knockoff and Stone Edge, uh, it means that. It can just stat check a lot of matchups, and then the sand, um, the weather setting of sand uh, means that like teams that rely on Torkoal or you know the snow team that popped up at Utrecht all uh, are a lot easier with uh, Tarantar. And also just like having the uh, opportunity to use the sand to break focus ashes and stuff means that you do have a lot of playing potential even in like worse matchups. Uh, Titar can always just be there to. Um, like swing matchups and a lot of the, my core pieces or not a lot but like Como and Iron Crown both being immune to Sandstorm uh, does actually make like a pretty big difference uh, when it comes to just like over the course of uh, a set or a tournament like the sand chip does rack up quite a lot and so um, just having that piece made me feel more comfortable and also like it's well documented uh, but Como and Titar have great synergy with each other like they have 
Uh, they complement each other's weaknesses and strengths very well. Uh, there's very few Pokemon that can deal with both of them effectively. Uh, like the aforementioned Landorus I is one of the ones that originally like you might think would be good, but it's actually not very good into Titar. Like it's it's only okay into Titar. And so like um like a lot of the Pokemon uh that origin or like even if you want to say Fluttermane, Titar actually does have a pretty good matchup into Fluttermane. Um and so like the, the Pokemon complement each other well, and then si similarly, Iron uh, Titar and Iron Crown actually do uh, have decent synergy because um, the Psychic types that Iron Crown doesn't want to hit, uh, want to get, uh, or the Psychic types that Iron Crown can't hit, Titar can hit, and then similarly, the Steel types and uh, other resists like uh, Steel and Dark types can still be hit by Titar's Low Kick. So um, the offensive synergy is pretty good there, and um, Basically, the, the important thing to cover for is that the Combo and Titar both have very strong Incineroar matchups, which is something that's important with uh, when playing around an Iron Crown that can't really hit Incineroar for uh, a lot of damage. So uh, then the last slot was Whimsicott. Uh, Whimsicott, similarly, also uh, as Titar, was meant to be tacked out for these fringe matchups. So originally, um, one of the strong, uh, or the toughest matchups was the uh, Cresselia or Saluna matchup, um, the Crest Bear, as it's called. And uh, so I came up with the set, <laughs> Misty Terrain Charm. And um, it's like still made the matchup not that good. Like realistically, it, it turned the Crest Bear matchup from like a 95 5 matchup to like a 50 50 matchup, maybe even a 40 60 matchup for me. Um, but it did just make it more playable. Uh, I, but then I found that these moves also ended up being very helpful in other matchups, which I didn't end up playing any of the matchups that it was specifically teched for uh, this weekend. But the moves themselves can be usable in a lot of situations. So examples for Misty Terrain's usefulness include, like, you turn off the Flame Orb from uh, Hisuian or Saluna. You turn off uh, access to Yawn and Wisp from, like, Ting Dozo. Uh, Amoongus is like less of an issue for this team because you do have uh, both Combo and like Psy Spam and Hearth Flame and stuff like that. But uh, like you already have three Spore Immunes, and with the Psy Spam part, like Amoongus is not that big of a deal. But it does do that. Um, but more so the Wisp from Incense and um, Yawn from uh, from Dozo, and then also uh, you reduce Dragon type moves, which. Uh, a lot of the reason why I haven't been running Misty Terrain in previous set, uh, previous teams is that Misty Terrain, or like I often use Dragon Moves on, on my team, but this team actually doesn't have any Dragon Moves. My Dragon type is Como, which doesn't have a Dragon Move. And uh, because of that, there is a cool interaction against Raging Bolt where you can actually tank one hit from AV uh, Raging Bolt, like a Draco, and then uh, the Misty ter Terrain will basically turn off their Raging Bolt entirely because their Draco just stops being able to do enough damage to KO your Como. So there are some lines where you can um, just click Misty Terrain versus Raging Bolt, and it just uh, walls, like you can just full wall and ignore it. Uh, similarly, I think one of the most interesting things about Whimsicott, and the reason why I have Whimsicott on this team over um, over Tornadus is because Raging Bolt is uh, like a pretty big issue, and I'll, I'll get to this a little bit more later. Uh, but the Hearth Flame is also Stomping Tantrum for uh, Raging Bolt as well. But because Raging Bolt is a big issue, Torn cannot be on this team. It just uh, doesn't. Uh, it's too negative into Raging Bolt, and so because of that, uh, Whimsicott's chosen, and it can actually it just full walls it. So with Covert Cloak and the Natural Typing, you are immune to Dragon, you resist Electric, you resist Dark. You are immune to Snarl, uh, immune to Electro Web. So the Pokemon is just very, very good. The, the Moonblast hits it super effectively. And even though it's not the most damage, like you're doing like basically 30 to 40% with a Moonblast, it does actually get there. And so like in because Raging Bolt, like it has to really use its health as a resource. If And it's relatively slow at making progress, Raging Bolt is. So like if you just put Whimsicott in front of it and click Moonblast, like you are going to end up winning that situation like most of the time. Um, and so, like, the Pokemon ended up being, like, quite good uh, for that reason. Uh, and then, like, a lot of the other reasons why it's there is for having the option to click Tailwind against um, opposing Tailwind uh, matchups. Uh, the fact that I have Psychic Terrain is actually a another reason why Whimsicott is better here, uh, because what is important is that in a, a Tailwind Mirror, 
uh, oftentimes I want to just set up my Iron Crown early. And so an example lead would be like Iron Crown plus NDD. I can click the Calm Mind, let my NDD die, uh, bring in Whimsicott afterwards, and then uh, I can get the Tailwind off and they can't taunt me in the mirror because uh, I have Psychic Terrain. So because of that, like it means that uh, because Whimsicott is grounded and Torn wouldn't be, uh, this is another advantage for why Whimsicott was chosen. Uh, and then Charm, uh, similarly, is to hit Ursaluna, but also it hits uh, Dozdo. It gives me a playable Dozo matchup. Actually, it's relatively favored if they're not Clear Amulet, which I did run to a few times uh, on ladder, but didn't end up, play end up playing the, the full Dozo uh, in um, in tournament. But uh, Dozo, which would be a near unwinnable matchup, becomes pretty, pretty decent. Uh, in fact, I think I'm slightly favored uh, versus the non-Clear Amulet sets. And then uh, also it's... Decent into the Ogre Pond Wellspring. It gives you an, uh, an option to at least uh, neuter its damage and try to uh, reduce the effectiveness. Because when it can click Cudgel into uh, like the all uh, everything except for Como, it, it can get kind of annoying. So um, yeah, th that, that's like basically the overall view of my team. Um, I think the the moves themselves are relatively self-explanatory. With I think the Whimsicott set and then uh, Hearthflame Stomping Tantrum. Um, I think I tested a lot on um, with the grass move originally, but the grass move actually doesn't really hit that much for Hearthflame. There's only two ma major targets, and you could say that they're arguably very important, but for this team, uh, I felt that it was more important for uh, it to hit Raging Bolt uh, and uh, Hosui and Arcanine and some other stuff, but like mostly Raging Bolt and Incineroar. Um, the ones that you have to give up is uh, Urshifu Rapid Strike and uh, Wellspring. Mostly when Wellspring Terra's, when it doesn't Terra, it still takes more from Ivy Cudgel. So like between uh, those two mons, I felt that they were more manageable, um, especially because those mons both have pretty losing uh, Como matchups, and then uh, Urshifu has a very losing uh, Iron Crown matchup. So the um, like the fact that I didn't cover for those mods specifically, like met, felt less of a big deal to me than having Stommy Tantrum just to hit the Incineroar and the uh, Raging Bolt. And so uh, that's the reason why Stomping Tantrum's on this team. And then uh, on Titar, why it's Stone Edge over, I don't know, like whatever. Uh, I I'm not even sure what the standard set on Titar would be, I guess. Like, I guess this is the standard set. Uh, some people might be running Terror Blast instead of Stone Edge, I guess. Um, but Stone Edge just. If you play Booster Fluttermane, uh, there's a good chance that Stone Edge will OKO it uh, after the Sand Chip. So that's like just something that's relevant. Uh, and it's almost, I think it's guaranteed to KO after two Sand Chips. So like basically that uh, interaction is just makes it a lot stronger than the other options that you have, like Terra Blast or whatever. Um, and it can just be nice to have the single target rock move versus like Chiyu, uh, Glamora, like yeah, it's situations like that. So, um, yeah. Do you have any questions about um, team? That that makes a lot of sense. That's a really great overview of uh, <laughs> all the Pokemon. Um, I guess the uh, the one the one aspect that you didn't really go dive into is the uh, the EV spreads, um, where it looks like you got sure. uh, so some some really interesting EV spreads. Do you know off the top of your head what exactly you have calculated for? Yeah. Um, so. Oh, right. There's a, there is actually one more thing for the moves, which is NDD uh, has protect over the more common um, the more common trick room. I guess is is the the one in that slot. And I think, in my opinion, um, when I want uh, NDD to play a redirecting role, I almost always want it to have uh, protect. I think just redirectors having protect is are much much stronger, uh, especially in open team shoot settings. They just um, it makes the Pokemon way more versatile. Uh, I, I've won so many more games because of NDD having Protect, and like you know, it's uh, like it does mean that you have to play so differently in certain matchups. But I do think Protect is just much stronger overall as a move. Um, and I, I'm not a huge believer in clicking Trick Room. Um, it's just like whatever. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to the EV spreads. Uh, I'll just go top down. I'll go the simplest to the more complicated ones. Uh, so I think Iron Crown is the simplest one. Um, it is just max speed because uh, you have to be max speed for the speed booster and then um, as much special attack as I could fit and then the rest is in HP. Uh, there's nothing really complicated about it. I think 
there might be a more optimized bulk spread even for it, but like this is just fine. Uh, I, I didn't bother really looking too deep into it, but um, this is just like the speed booster spread. Mm -hmm. um, TTAR similarly, very self-explanatory. It's max speed. This is the same one that I ran at uh, Portland and Sacramento. I mean, like technically it's like one speed point different because I think at Sacramento I was 244 speed instead of 252, but now there's four things that hit to uh, 112. So like I'm just going to, to the 113 speed stat. Um, and so uh, TTAR, relatively self-explanatory. It's just max, max. Uh, I want it to be as fast and strong as possible. Um, even though there isn't like uh, IC spread stuff or whatever, there is a lot of interactions with Tailwind that you want to be just as fast as possible. And then also just like the matchups that I bring TTAR to, um, having it be able to outpace like the slower base 80, 85 guys uh, can often be very important. So like um, if they're like low speed on Goldie, for example, they can be outsped by TTAR um, or more commonly, like you can outspeed like Rillabooms and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, those two relatively self-explanatory. NDD relatively self-explanatory as well. Uh, actually, this paste I think is wrong. Uh, I didn't. I ended up going with 31 IVs. Um, I just never found the interaction with 29 to ever come up, and it didn't ever come up in tournament. Uh, the 31 IV interaction, which was, would have been versus uh, Max Speed Blood Moon, also didn't come up in the tournament. Although I did think that it would, uh, like based on practice beforehand, but um, it just didn't come up. Uh, I, I would say like it doesn't really matter. The bulk itself, I don't actually know what it does. Um, it just is relatively bulky. Um, mm -hmm. The <laughs> like, I didn't go too deep into it. I just got an EV spread from someone else, and I was just like, okay, like uh, it just needs to be generally bulky. Um, and there wasn't something specific that I was trying to live with it. Um, yeah, I think. Um, let me think. Um, there is like some fringe situations which are important with this team, which is uh, like versus Porygon two, like the special defense stat uh, stuff. You want to give it the attack boost, and so like having NDD be more specially defensive is a little bit better because it means that if you just send out NDD with anything else on the team, uh, including like Como and stuff, it will always give Porygon two the attack boost, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, that that was just like something I observed, but it didn't really. Um, like it wasn't something that I was thinking about necessarily with the EV spreads. Um, moving on, let's see. Como uh, is this is the same spread I ran at Portland. Uh, I know that generally people have been looking at uh, the spread that Scott used, which is the one that he uh, took from my Sacramento team, which is the 156 defense, uh, which uh, Oko's Glass Ogre Pond. Uh, however, with Glass Ogre Pond being like very rare nowadays uh there's only uh, like a few of them some some hearts play more run it but like pretty uncommon in general um i opted for a less defensive spread and more speed up to have a better matchup into lander's eye the offer uh which is the hardest matchup for como and it's also a common pokemon and so uh also there there is some other fringe matchups which like you want more speed up versus like the raging bolt matchup i mentioned earlier and there are a bunch of other situations uh, with more special attackers in the meta in general. It just means having more speed F has been more valuable. And I think with having a lower defense is that um, even though like you don't Oko Glass Ogre Pond and stuff, like at plus four, you still Oko everything. There is a few KOs that you missed out on plus two. Uh, and then you still always beat the physical attackers. Like it doesn't matter how much defense you have really. Like at plus two, you just always full wall all of the physical attackers. So it doesn't really matter. Like it, it doesn't change any uh, two hit KOs, two Okos for the opponent either. Like for example, like you still live at Gen Pow, Ice Cold Crash. Uh, you still live, like I don't know, uh, like Earth Shift Close Combat, Base of Ice, Sword of Runer, like whatever, like whatever you can think of. Like you can still always live one physical hit, basically. Um, so like generally speaking, I think the more speed up spread makes more sense nowadays. Um, Did you feel like? And yeah. Did you feel like you missed any offensive calcs with it? Uh, so there's only one specific offensive calc that you do miss, which is that you don't Oko Urshifu from uh, full with at plus two with Sword of Ruin. Um, that being said, I just don't think it's that important. It didn't come up during the tournament. Um, and I don't think in general that um, it matters very much. Um, 
like the the difference in offense is no, like it's noticeable for sure but like in general uh you can just boost more and um you always like once you get to plus four you will always get there versus everything and at plus two there are some calcs that you miss but i think in general this bedef was more valuable to me than the uh extra damage from from that 120 investment um so i mean i do think it's a little bit team context dependent but my opinion right now is that current meta i think the this spread is is better than the the one that i was running at sacramento well you are the um, expert so i don't think anyone's gonna question you <laughs> uh yeah especially for this team i think this is uh for sure it's better um and then moving on to whimsicott i think this one's the the next most complicated but Whimsicott, um, so the the speed ben benchmark is just to hit faster than Tornadus. Um, there's a few mons in between Tornadus uh, and Whimsicott. Like, you could run more speed to creep Roaring Moon, but I ended up deciding that the um, the speed points ended up, are, are going to, or sorry, the EV points on Whimsicott actually mattered a lot. And uh, every I was trying to squeeze out as many points as I could from Whimsicott because um, when you don't put enough special attack into Whimsicott, it becomes like pretty useless. Uh, you can just ignore the mod completely. And so I needed to try to get as much special attack in, in it as possible while still maintaining the uh, like the things that were important about the mod. So uh, I wanted the security of always being able to be torn, even though they're not always timid, but there's at least a sizable amount of them that are timid. Um, and like 20 to 30% of them, uh, at least, uh, I don't know the exact number, but uh, at minimum, there's like 20 to 30% that are timid. and um, being able to outspeed them or it is just like an important thing for Whimsicott to have. That's like the one of the main reasons uh, or main advantages that has over Torn in general. Uh, although I did list some of the other reasons why I would run Whimsicott, but um, the HP stat is to live a Bleak Windstorm guaranteed from a four special attack tornado. Um, it didn't end up coming up into the tournament in the tournament or even that much in practice, to be honest. So like, I would probably be like, I wouldn't be that shocked if you could just go max special attack on this uh whim and still be okay but uh i did think that in general like having some amount of bulk uh was uh, going to be useful and i felt like it was like uh pretty useful to just have some amount of bulk um and i didn't know what other benchmark that was going to be important so that was just the one i uv'd for and then the rest is in special attack like i said i think having a lot of special attack on the whim was going to be important it just makes the mod less ignorable um, and so, like, just being able to chunk things with Moonblast, uh, and get into a position where, like, you can click the Tailwind and actually start clicking Moonblast and, and get a lot of value from the Pokemon. Um, and so, yeah. And then it's also Terra Rock. Uh, I don't, I think I kind of, like, glossed over that earlier, but Terra Rock, I don't think I, I want to say I didn't tear it during Vancouver, but, like, it was probably the most impactful Terra I could think of, just because you also get the special defense boost and... I didn't want to go steel because being weak to fire still is kind of bad and I didn't want to go uh, water because I just felt like the torn matchup was too important so the, fi the, the one type resisting both fire and flying is rock and uh, as a bonus the, the, the matchup you do want to tear a whim in which is against like the Chiyu um, Glamora stuff is uh, the one where rock will be the most impactful as well because you do get the special defense boost which matters in that matchup. Um, and then finally, Ogre Pine. Um, this one is definitely a doozy of an EV spread. Um, so the reason why I went with this spread, so max speed is uh, definitely like a guarantee. Um, I think that max speed is just a must on Ogre Pine uh, Hearth Flame because you want to uh, at least have the security of going for the tie, uh, especially when you are in situations of ogre pond ogre pond uh like oftentimes you want to click the terra button and um like ogre pond is one of the the second um the the, the uh yeah uh after iron crown it's the second most terrid mon on this team iron crown terra is in like almost maybe like 50 percent of the games and then ogre pond terra is in like 30 to 40 percent of the games and almost none of the other mons terra um except for like in fringe situations but like uh, because you want to Terra it so much, um, and whenever you Terra Ogre Pond, you need it to be faster than the other Ogre Ponds, especially against Wellspring. And so, like, um, being max speed was uh, a must for this uh, team. And so that that was a starting point. 
And then the next point is that because this mod clicks follow me a lot more than any other move, like I click what's cooking follow me more than IV cudgel. Uh, in fact, I have like the I did a bunch of pass race data uh, before the tournament as, as part of my practice. And the um, in fact, I could actually give that to you, uh, which might be cool to put, uh, put up on screen. Yes, but um, uh, I think follow me was my most clicked move uh, on Ogre Pond, I believe, on, on this. Um, Passwords might be a little wonky because I have a lot of replays in there, so like it might it might not load. But um, um, yeah, follow me was my most clicked move, I believe, on on this uh, on this team, and so it was important to me that I needed it to be uh, very um, defensive. Like it needed to be able to live hits, and mo most specifically in this situation, I needed it to live Urshifu hits. Uh, in fact, uh, this spread is optimized to live Surging Strikes. Uh, and Terra Water Surging Strikes does not KO me, uh, or I think it has a 1 in 16 chance, or maybe a 1 in 8 chance to KO me. But it's basically the the most, uh, the most, least likely chance to KO uh, at this tier, because to go up to the next percentage uh, tier of like guaranteeing to live, you have to invest like an extra 25 EVs or something like that, or like 24 EVs, or, or like whatever. It's like something jank like that because of how Urshifu works. Um, and so it's like basically s s designed to be able to live a surging one uh, surging strikes with one multiplier, like a one either a Terra Water, a Mystic Water, or a Sword of Ruin. If you combine them, then it does it no longer lives unless they like drop attack. Um, but that d does come up a lot, like uh, specifically the surging strikes uh, situation where they. Uh, surging strikes with sort of ruin doesn't ko and because of that um you can get a free uh turn because they have or not free it's not really free. your second your ogre pond but you can redirect two attacks with your ogre pond which uh is a very very important thing and uh the rest is just an attack uh you just want it to hit as hard as possible and while like you know obviously i would love for it to have more attack you just can't have everything uh so the things that ended up being the most important to me is that that it could live the urshifu hits and that it has the um speed stat and then the rest um is just going to be an attack to try to hit as hard as possible in the matchups where i needed to do damage um so yeah like i, I think uh this did come up quite a few times in the tournament where i was able to like you know tank a few hits uh in fact in my stream match uh, in top eight, you'll notice that like uh, in game one, turn one, I just go for the Terra and go for the Wicked Blow, or, or and uh, just you know try to tank the Wicked Blow from Terra Dark Urshifu, and uh, I have a 87.5 percent chance to live that. That one is a one eighth uh, chance, and um, I KO'd, and you'll, you'll see like I was like visibly upset like in the player cam, like I uh, shook my head and I wasn't happy about it because. You know, it's a one in eight chance to KO. Mm -hmm. And so game two, I just ran it straight back and I lived it that time. Um, and, you know, they, the commentators were a little bit surprised. They were like, yeah, we know how this goes or whatever. And they were surprised that I even clicked the terror button turn one. Uh, but no, I I, know, I knew for sure that I lived. And I think in that set, I was supposed to even go for the, that same line game three as well. Uh, I just deviated and ended up uh like overthinking it a little bit but whatever uh regardless the the ogre pond spread is designed specifically for urshifu in mind um and you have good odds to live uh basically and it's uh generally a very winning line if they have to commit two attacks into you um like including like if they terra and commit two attacks into you um and like this is like one of the few, I, I mean like this is relatively well documented i think but um there's a lot of um there's a lot of, um, you know, there's not a lot of info that you can hide in general, but uh, being able to hide the EV spreads specifically for this situation uh, matters a lot because you can easily win uh, multiple games or, you know, one game of a set or multiple games of a set off of like that kind of information where um, this is one of the things that like, you know, it is, I think I'll, uh, maybe not everyone knows about it, but it's, Something that should be probably done more uh, for specifically Hearthflame, where you can run this. It's a uh, kind of like this mixed bulk spread, uh, where it's not exactly full bulk um, and it's not exactly um, like no bulk, but 
it's like this mixed bulk spread where it still functions basically as both a redirector and also a offensive Pokemon. Uh, and it, it's unique to Hearthflame specifically because Hearthflame can use the Terra to really become an offensive Pokemon. Uh, and like, I think before this event, uh, or before I started with this uh, building this team, I had I was very low on Hearthflame in general. I thought the Pokemon was not very good. Uh, I had a very like I thought I had very big issues with you know hitting Fire and Dragon types, and like my perspective on the mod was that I just thought it was like a mediocre Pokemon. Um, and that there wasn't a great reason to run it over Wellspring. But after playing with it a lot, I think like the thing that it really has over Wellspring is the more fluidity in game plans where like, even though you can tear a Wellspring and, and make it kind of like a, the main damage dealer of a game plan, it really doesn't work as well as Hearthflame uh, in that sense. Like uh, Hearthflame being able to click the Terra and just change how the, the Mon plays completely uh, makes the, the Pokemon a lot more dynamic and that's like really where the strength of the Pokemon lies um, where I think Wellspring the typing and the the like Terra Water on uh, Wellspring like you actually carry zero weaknesses uh, which makes the Pokemon like overall stronger in my opinion but like Hearthflame does do some specific things that are very very strong and so yeah the, like I really like the spread and like I'm more of a believer, or I'm a pretty big believer now, I should say, in Hearthflame now. Um, I think there are still, like in general, I think Wellspring is a lot better, but Hearthflame has some niches where it is very strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. This is actually, I think this, I ran a very similar spread, uh, like max max speed, mm -hmm. very little attack uh, at San Antonio. I think this is a, a really cool way of running it. I think this is one of the better ways of running it. And I really like Stomping Tantrum right now too. I think that... Um, yeah, yeah. Being walled by uh, Raging Bolt is kind of a no-no for for a lot of Pokemon. This one included, but uh, but yeah, that's a that's a really good overview of the team and you know everything about it. Did you have any um, for anyone trying to pick up this team? Did you have any uh, tips that you haven't already talked about for how to play the team? Yeah, so I think I mentioned it a little bit at the top, uh, which is that the team has like it's about the core four. Uh, in around 50 to 60 percent of the matchups you really want to be playing around uh como iron crown uh ndd and hearth flame uh probably like 60 percent of the matchups you want to really be core uh, on these core four pokemon and uh there's like you can actually mix it up like game to game uh depending on like the the actual matchup itself like if the matchup is positive in one way or the other like you really just want to force it in in the way that you have the most winning lines like for example like uh, I mentioned versus Stein earlier, uh, Iron Crown uh, NDD or Iron Crown uh, with either Hearthflame or NDD lead, like can just crush them uh, straight off the bat. But uh, generally speaking, you could lead any of the combination of these uh, four Pokemon. Although, like I, even Como plus Iron Crown in some situations can be good, but mostly like Iron Crown plus Hearthflame or Como plus Hearthflame or Iron. NDD or Como NDD can all be very, very strong. And you basically just want to threaten the possibility of being able to click follow me plus a setup move on turn one. And um, in certain situations, you can even go on the offensive and you know prey on the fact that they expect you to do that. So uh, for example, you could lead Ogre Pond and uh, Crown and Terra your Ogre Pond turn one to try to punish them. And uh, like I think throughout the tournament, I played really heavily on the mind games of that, where you know game one, um, an example would be that They'll lead, like, for example, uh, like, uh, let me think, like, Ogre Pond plus Instin would be, like, a, a common lead versus me, or Instin plus Pow, for example, would be a common lead versus me. Um, and I lead Iron Crown uh, Hearthflame. And it's very, very rare, actually, that people will click the uh, fake out into either of your mons on turn one of game one. And so I will always just click follow me and... Um, Follow me and Calm Mind on turn one, as they expect me to uh, click, like either go pivot NDD or tear my well, uh, tear my Hearth Flame or something like that. But no, I just will do that. They'll parting, they'll protect their other Mon parting shot with in Zen, and I just get uh, infinite advantage on, on turn one. And oftentimes, like you can just win the game off of that alone. Um, you know, obviously, I'm I'm leaking a little bit of the secrets <laughs> here, but like. Um, you you want to play off that a little bit because uh, based on how they react uh, off that turn uh, turn one game one like 
they'll think about that in game two and game three, and then um, be, uh, you can try to go for more offensive options. So like an example is, uh, then they try to, like if they try to lead Urshifu versus you, maybe in game one, they expect uh, that you are going to just go for the offensive uh, option, and then you, you get to get the free combine off, and then in game two, you can just, you know, say, all right, uh, you can do whatever you want, uh, but I'm going to now click expanding force, and then just get pick up free KOs because they expect you to click the the more passive options. Um, and similarly, I think uh, like for Como, a lot of pe players will expect on turn one that you're just going to go for that iron defense, and so you can play off that as well, and you can just go for uh, helping hand body press, for example. I, I caught quite a few people off guard. Uh, throughout the tournament by just leading Como and NDD and they lead their Incineroar, they think they're safe, and I just click Helping Hand Body Press, kill their Incineroar in turn one, and that's often enough to win the game by itself. Um, and similarly, just like the reach of Helping Hand with Body Press, in fact, I think uh, even like at plus two, for example, getting plus two Helping Hand Body Press onto like Raging Bolts uh, is can be game winning at times. Like uh, people are not expecting that to be an option, even though you have them on the open team sheet, just like being able to click helping hand with body press is not something that normally happens ever and that um is just gives you incredible reach and and oftentimes can just win you games by itself um and so you know being able to play off the expectations of what your uh what the opponent is expecting you to do and playing unpredictably is really what the sh where the, a lot of the strengths of the team are because uh the game plans can be pretty fluid right so like uh, you can lead Iron Crown and Hearthflame in game one, and and uh, they might be expecting that and lean very heavily into their dark types. And then you can lead Como in game two and really catch them off guard, like if they were to try to lead their like Ensign and like Pal, for example. And so um, just trying to play play heavily off of that information um, and like opponent tendencies uh, is really like important on this team. Uh, past that, like when to identify when which Pokemon uh, are good, it's just a little bit about experience. But there's generally some telling signs, right? So uh, for Iron Crown, you don't want to lead Iron Crown into AV Bolt. If you if you see an AV Bolt, you generally will want to lead Como. Uh, and similarly, if you see things like Goldango or Fluttermane on the enemy team, uh, you want to lead Iron Crown. And so like being able to recognize like. You don't want to expend too many resources. Like, uh, you don't want to lead Como in matchups where uh, you're going to be forced to expend early resources. But you can do it in like a game two or three where they might expect you to lead Iron Crown and, and leave like their Landorus at home, for example, um, and or like Landorus or Fluttermane out of the lead. Um, but like in game one, you don't want to lead Como and like against Fluttermane because it they will force you to like Terra early, and oftentimes you don't want to Terra with Como unless you have to. Um, it's no longer a meta game where Como can literally just one v four the the opponent team, and so you do you know if you have to tear the Como, it's not ideal most of the time. Um, and then moving on from the the core four, when to identify when to not bring those guys. Uh, so I mentioned some of the problem Pokemon earlier, uh, like Goldengo, like um, uh, like Raging Bolt, like uh, Fluttermane. If you see a lot of them, and uh, including the the one I haven't mentioned is um, Roaring Moon. If you see a lot of those, especially with the Roaring Moon, then you want to start to rely on T-Tar more. Um, and there are some other fringe matchups like Sun, Hail, uh, like against Torn teams, you want to really bring the T-Tar. Um, and then, you know, in Tailwind matchups, you often want to bring the Whimsicott. You want to lead on your Iron Crown and Whimsicott combo and uh, like try to play a, a lot around the speed control because your Iron Crown is going to be basically faster than their entire team when in Tailwind, like when you're both in Tailwind. Um, and then T-Tar is always good into like hard Trick Room. It's good into uh, like all the weather matchups, basically. Um, and, you know, sometimes you do need to bring it just as a mix-up versus like the Raging Bolt and versus like King Gambit team sometimes. Um, and Whimsicott, similarly, you can bring as a mix-up into, you know, balanced teams that have like a Tornadus, but also... Uh, versus Raging Bolt, you can bring it to just like try to deal damage early. Um, and it can be good versus like Tinglu Dozo. It's good versus um, like hard Dozo, like the um, Dozo Giri, I guess. Um, it can be decent versus like um, 
like Crest Bear or Hard TR, like all, all of these matchups where the tech moves are really teched out. And um, like that's kind of like the, the core philosophy of this team is that you're generally going to be bringing the four uh, mons that uh, are make up your core game plan. But in the matchups where you run into the ones that they're hard teched out for your other two mons, uh, you do want to bring them because that's what they're there for. Like, um, like Tyrantar, like, like I said earlier, has a really strong uh like it has really polarizing um typing and that, that extends a lot to its uh, matchup spread where it's not always the best it has a pretty poor Rillaboom matchup for example and wellspring matchup but when it has strong matchups like versus sun it has really really strong matchups like they uh cannot re like versus hard trick room like it's the most important piece on your team and so you really want to be starting to play around the t-tar heavily and um yeah like that's basically how you want to play the team like just stick to the core four in general and then you'll start to learn uh wh which matchups are not going to be the uh, like where you can't just uh just use the core four and you need to start branching out and um when you when you run into the matchups that are important for or that are teched for that your, your tech mons then bring your tech mons uh basically mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense so with that let's talk about your uh your tournament experience, um, you did cover a lot of this on our uh, Tub Takes podcast that you were on uh, this week. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but yeah, if you want to give me a, a little bit of a rundown, how did your, how did, how did Vancouver go for you? Obviously you cut, so presumably pretty well, but, uh, but also <laughs> give me maybe one or two highlight matches uh, from, from your tournament run. Yeah. So in day one, um, going in, I slept very little. I, uh, Actually, this has been like a recurring theme in tournaments nowadays. Like, I, I have not slept well at all of the tournaments I've been to, like in the last year, basically. Um, it's the and so, <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, no, of course, the wingspan. I mean, of course, but no, um, yeah, I, I just haven't slept that, didn't sleep well the, the previous night, and then going into the tournament, I was like, uh, generally want a little bit of a warm up, so. Uh, I, I kind of lucked out a little bit that my first few opponents were all relatively inexperienced players, and so they uh, there were some pretty easy matchups as well as uh, pretty easy. Um, yeah, there were just some pretty easy matchups in, in terms of both the team and like you know the players being relatively inexperienced. Um, and so the first few rounds I kind of just like cruised by. Uh, There's a lot of Canadians actually. I think at day one I played seven Canadians. Mm -hmm. It looks like. Um, so yeah, I end up winning my first four matches relatively oh actually three of my first four matches relatively easily uh in round three actually it was a it was a very big sweater um i'm a little bit surprised actually that my opponent ended up finishing only three three with uh because they played super well and uh i mentioned earlier goldengo and landers i both problem pokemon for combo uh but this matchup i and and also this is a terra fairy p2 which is a, a lot worse for combo as well um and so I, I needed to make some really big reads in the set and uh i relied really heavily on iron crown uh this was in day one i was a very iron crown heavy day, uh, day. like i basically in uh, testing i think i brought iron crown to maybe like 75 percent of my games 80 percent of my games and combo to like 50 to 60. uh but in day one i think it was like a much worse or a much different split like uh it was mostly iron crown like i think almost every set that i played was a uh, was an iron crown set and so um this one like i needed to re rely heavily on the calm mind uh to stall out the trick room um and then uh really try to sweep after that um my opponent played super well and i ended up winning game like i was i lost game one and then in game two, I ended up only winning because I went for double protect without knowing I I had <laughs> already protected on the previous turn, and I just got it. And I realized afterwards, like oh, like after I locked in the move, I was like oh shoot, I protected, and I I just got the double protect, and I just got super lucky. And um, I mean, I think like there was a, still a chance I could have won from there, but like it was going to be very very tough. Um, and so then, like I ended up going on to win that set, um, but. For most of day one, it was relatively um, to the books, other than this matchup and round six, uh, which was versus Jesse Romalo, uh, who was also on tough takes. But um, 
he was playing uh, Banded Landorus, and this is a matchup I had known going in was going to be relatively tough. Um, I think he didn't necessarily figure out exactly what was uh, supposed to like what he was supposed to do in the matchup, and he led Landorus uh, Torn against me, which uh, is okay, uh, or it, it's relatively uh, bad for me, I should say, but. Um, I have one specific line which I had labbed out versus it because I knew going into the tournament that it was going to be a bad matchup. And that is to lead in DD Iron Crown and basically uh, trade their guys for my guys. Uh, and he goes for the Terra Ground Earthquake with his Landorus. And it. Uh, I live with like 8% or something in ga uh, game one. And so I thought I was safe. And uh, then game two, he kills me. And I later find out that there was an 18% roll. Uh, I should have known based on game one that in game two it was a roll um, like in my favor, because you know if I live on 8% at max, like it would have been like a 30% roll or something like that. But um, I end up trying to deviate in game three, and uh, I end up getting to a winning end game, and I just choke it on a very aggressive play. Like um, I just I thought his how was going to protect on a turn when I had like a 85% chance to win or something like that if I just go went for the safe play. Uh, and then I ended up losing that game um, and I was kind of beating myself up over it a little bit because it was a could have been a one game basically from, from my perspective. But uh, I ended up still clutching it out. Uh, got some pretty tough opponents in the back half. Uh, you know, got Aaron Brock and uh, NJ, Navjeet, uh, and then played Alex Pan for my winning in. And I don't actually remember exactly what happened in a lot of these sets, but um, I, I think they were all three game sets uh, all the way down the board. So like round five, six, seven, eight were all three game sets, but I ended up pulling them all out. Um, and then in round nine, um, I got pretty lucky in game one and then won a pretty clean game two to finish the day 8-1. Um, and yeah, at, at this point, I was feeling really, really good about myself. Almost every loss was um, either due to bad luck or me playing bad or both. Um, and so I was feeling like really, really good uh, going into day two. Uh, once again, didn't sleep at all <laughs> during day, between day one and two. Like I slept like two hours or something. Um, and so I headed out like really early in the morning. I woke up at like 3 a.m. and was watching some YouTube uh, and stuff. And then uh, ended up like going to the venue at like 7 a.m. They had us go like super early as well, which is crazy. But it did kind of work out for me because um, because I was up so early. Um, and so I win my round one uh, off of pure matchup. This is the one I mentioned earlier was versus Sun had basically unlosable matchup. And so I just, you know, took my free win there and then uh, played Neil. Um, I got some info about Neil was a three game sw sweater as well. And this is a very Como heavy matchup. This one was like probably the most, uh, no, it, was, it wasn't the most interesting, but one of the most interesting sets that I played this weekend because in game three, it came super down to the wire. Ended up in a situation where it was Como versus uh, three of his guys, which was Urshifu uh Rillaboom and Hearthflame, I think, something like that. Um and I was like I think it was Hearthflame and and uh Rillaboom as the last two. Or on the two on the field and an unrevealed Pokemon in the back. And I was convinced that he had brought um Incineroar. So I just went for the helping hand plus uh body press onto the uh Ogre Pond. Uh I mentioned earlier but because of my spread, I'm not guaranteed to Oko, so I wanted to lock it up, and I thought that the Insin and uh, Urshifu in the back would never be, or, or sorry, the Insin and Rillaboom would never be able to win. But then he ends up revealing that his last Pokemon is Urshifu instead. So it ends up in a situation where I have, uh, yes, Fake Out Active versus my, um, and an Urshifu versus my uh, Como. So he ends up going for and I'm only at plus two at the time, so, which doesn't KO either of his guys. Um, and so he goes for the fake out, gets the surging strike, and then he gets the, like, I have to go for the iron defense to get the, the next KO. So I get another uh, iron, I get an iron defense and he surging strikes and, and wood hammers. And for the last, like, four or five turns of the game, he starts going for timer because, like, I don't know, he thinks that's his only out or whatever. 
to be fair, uh, you know, like, I mean, whatever, you can play your outs, but, like, it was not going to ever be get to timer. Like, there was still, like, five minutes or whatever left. And so it was not close to timer. Like, it didn't, even at the end of the game, it never popped up, like, the three minutes left or whatever. Uh, because Como just always wins too fast. But, um, yeah, so, like, he goes, he goes for the fake out, surging strikes, uh, wood hammer, surging strikes, wood hammer, surging strikes, whatever, every single turn. And... It was funny because like the wood hammer and the shooting strikes were doing like because the gratitude terrain came back up like I was healing more than the wood hammer was doing damage. Um, and so, like he goes, uh, he gets I think three shooting strikes off uh, alongside two wood hammers before I get to KO his Urshifu. And at the lowest after the first uh, fake out or sorry after the last uh, wood hammer, my Como I believe was at thirteen HP. So it was very, very close to to the point where I would have died to the um, Urshifu. But, you know, Urshifu's damage is also somewhat guaranteed. Like, you can't crit the Shooting Strike. So he only had two chances to really crit me with Rillaboom. Um, and then I did end up pulling that game out. And advancing to 10 and 1. Um, talked a little bit about, about my stream set already earlier. Uh, I ended up choking this that Or, I'll say, game 1... He brought the wrong mons, and I ended up winning uh, after a disastrous turn one. He led um, Urshifu and Tornadus, KO'd my guy as I tear it, KO'd my Hearthflame as I tear it, and as I click Moonblast, and then I had to play around the taunt because uh, I mentioned earlier that Whimsicott doesn't have Psychic Train, so I made a really weird play on stream. Like, I think I clicked, I went Iron Crown, and then I immediately swapped it to NDD. Because I didn't want him to click Bleak Wind, I wanted him to click Taunt. But he ends up clicking, uh, I think he clicks Sucker Punch on Bleak Wind instead of Taunt onto my Whimsicott. So I just like look like, uh, like he just kills my Whimsicott as well. So turn one, one and two go like basically as bad as they could. Uh, but I did get the Tailwind up. So then I'm now put in a position with Iron Crown plus, um, plus NDD versus his like, Torn and uh, Urshifu, and so I somehow end up winning this game. Like I, I watched it back, and it was basically just that because he didn't bring Entei, he didn't actually have anything to hit the Iron Crown in the back. He has uh, Fluttermane and um, I think Fluttermane and, and uh, Glamora, and he switches his Fluttermane into a uh, Dazzling Gleam, and the Dazzling Gleam chip actually gets there because because of the fact that I click Dazzling Gleam. I get enough chip that Tachyon Cutter kills it. Um, because it doesn't kill from full, like, most of the time, unless you're, like, literally no bulk. Um, and then I dodge Icy Wind, which I'm still not sure if it would have mattered in, in the, the grand scheme of things for this set, but, uh, like, to be fair, he also got an 18% chance to kill, so, like, you know, whatever, dodging the, uh, or, sorry, a 12% chance to kill, so dodging the Icy Wind is, like, a little bit of justice, I guess. Um, and then I click Calm Mind as he protects with his Glamora, and I end up winning that game. And then game two, I made the, basically the perfect call on what he's going to bring in the back. And uh, I see that, or like, I, I know that he's going to bring the Entei. And so uh, I actually thought he was going to bring both Entei and Wellspring, but he did end up only going for the Entei. And so um, I pivot to the T-Tar plan. Uh, I don't get KO turn one after the same like plays go down in turn one. And then in game two, I uh, or then I pivot in my T tar, and then I get crit. He had two chances to crit me. Uh, I had the charm into the Entei, so he had had to crit one of the two attacks, uh, either Moonblast or uh, Stomping into my T tar, and then he gets the crit. I did also have to hit land the Stone Edge, but that would have been the set uh, if I had landed the Stone Edge there because Como would have won uh, in the back. And um, unfortunately, it didn't end up coming that down that way. I was also a little bit sad because. Uh, because of the fact that the Como, or sorry, that I got crit and didn't get the KO, I would have gotten to click Misty Terrain because Misty Terrain was the best way to clean out the, this set. Uh, because then I would have Misty Terrain to block Sacred Fire Burn. And so that would have been the best, most clean way to click it or to, to win the, the set. But I didn't end up getting to click Misty Terrain because I got crit, um, unfortunately. Uh, and then game three, I deviated from the game plan, like I said. And. Uh, I ended up making some questionable plays in general as well. Like, I think I uh, teared too early. I was a little bit too antsy in front of the Urshifu. Uh, I, I Terra Fairy my NDD turn one, and it basically means that I, 
the more important thing with terraferring my entity is that I wasn't able to terra psychic my iron crown, and I needed the damage from uh, terra psychic to really get there. So, uh, end up losing the set. Uh, I basically get stalled out by the ente, and uh, then I lose that set. Uh, then I play a really close set versus Ashton. I have a pretty favorable matchup into his team actually, but then uh, like game one, I, I win pretty cleanly, and then game two, I get into a situation where I uh, or like he just outplays me. He gets me like multiple turns in a row. Uh, he just catches me, um, and I end up losing game two. And then game three, I just like uh, make a really good call and like bring Titar into uh, this team and. Uh, the T-Tar goes like really crazy in the game, and uh, I'm in a very, very winning end game basically. With uh, where like I, I think I didn't bring Hearth Flame in this uh, in this game, but I just get to a very winning end game and get to a position where um, he has two chances to crit me with Ogre Pond versus my Como, and uh, he gets the first crit, and uh, and I just lose the set. So, uh, like I I was a little bit miffed at this point because two sets in a row I lost to them having two chances to crit my Como and they crit um, or sorry not Co Como but like the two chances to crit me on a pivot all turn because it, in the previous one it was Titar and not Como uh, and so like I was talking with other people about this but my t the, there is a little bit of weakness with this team because you are going to take a lot of attacks and because you're set up stuff so um, there are, are always going to be chances for you to get crit uh, the, the team has very few inaccurate moves. Uh, only Titar has an inac inaccurate move, but you do always have the chance to get crit by your opponent, and that's just like real because you're giving them chances to crit you. So, um, you know, like it was annoying for sure. Like I had 80 plus percent chances to win both of those sets, and ended up uh, losing um, in both of those sets to low percentage odds. But uh, then I get into the last game. Uh, last round versus Alberto, and this was a grinder. Uh, it was insane that actually. Um, it, unfortunately for Alberto, it was a really tough uh, pairing for him because it meant that because he played me, uh, if he lost, he would miss out on money. He actually ended up finishing 17th, and then if he won, he wouldn't have even gone in, into cut. So uh, because I was uh, started at uh, eight and one, and I was playing him at basically what my record was two and two at the time. Um, so really rough pull for him, but obviously he still wants to play to win because he gets you know 750 bucks if he wins this uh, game. But this matchup uh, was really interesting because he ended up deciding to leave the Goldie and Raging Bolt on the bench for all three games. I want to say. Um, which was rare because those are the, like I mentioned at the top, those are the ones that actually caused me the most trouble. But he decided that those were not the ones that he wanted to play with. And uh, in game one, I win like super cleanly. He actually said that he misread my team sheet and thought that my Iron Crown was Terra Water, uh, or like didn't read my team sheet rather, I should say. And he thought my Iron Crown was Terra Water. And so um, I don't know exactly what changed what would, would have changed his play exactly on this uh, in that game but he um he terra waters his uh urshifu like very early in this game and um that basically means that i can just like kill all of his team once uh once i, I managed to uh get rid of that uh urshifu uh because in games two and three he actually tears steals his uh amungus instead and so in games one and two, I leave the uh, Como on bench, and I instead go for the Titar. Uh, and so I have, uh, and then like basically after in in game two, I just get like completely cycled by the Amoongus. The Amoongus starts sporing all of my slots. I'm just asleep on everything, and uh, it's just a disaster. Uh, and he ends up winning. And then game three, uh, once again, I lead Hearth Flame and. Um, I think I, no, uh, was it Hearthflame? Maybe it was NDD and Crown. I, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I led uh, Crown and another slot, and I forced his Amoongus to Terra turn one, where he he was very willing to give it up, I should say, um, the Terra on turn one. And so then I bring in my Como and end up in an end game where I can just cycle the uh, like the weather, and I get weather control. I get, uh, I get my Terra Steel in with... Uh, Pelper, and so then what happens is, oh no, no, I lied, um, 
T Tar in Iron Crown in, in, in uh, game three, and my T Tar was actually slower than his Pelipper, which is like relatively normal actually if they're max speed, which they generally are. Uh, so I get the the weather control, and then um, with with that I basically snowball the game, and like he put some of my mods to sleep, but, but because he was very willing to tear steal his Amigus on turn one, uh, I end up getting my Como in, and I. Uh, Get, catch his uh, Urshifu with like I think it was a Stone Edge and then into a Rocky Helmet like Surging Strikes into a Rocky Helmet and then I ended up killing that Urshifu and because of that I get to Terra Steel my Como basically for free and uh, with Terra Steel the interesting thing is that you get to Wall Pelper uh, in Sand because the Weather Wall becomes a Rock type move and then Hurricane becomes uh, is a Flying move so you resist both and then I full Wall Mungus because he's Sludge Bomb. Um, and so I basically just win the game off of that. Um, and yeah, then I end up getting into cut where I, in top eight, uh, I play the same matchup. He has a very similar team to Ashton, but he doesn't have the uh, assault vest on Raging Bull. He has uh, safety goggles. And just off of that, it meant that he had almost no matchup versus me. Um, I basically just set up Iron Crown and killed all of his Pokemon. Like I didn't really like, didn't even have to sweat this one at all. Um, he didn't. He basically didn't have anything that he could do versus me, <laughs> unfortunately for him. Uh, but yeah. Um, and then I played James in top four, and then uh, yeah, the, this was also a stream match, but uh, he just completely washed me. I think uh, looking back on it, I would, I didn't hate necessarily many of the plays I made. Uh, I, I made very few objective mistakes, um, but he just completely called me on every single turn. He was just on top of his game uh, that weekend, and especially in cut, and just was making every single play right. I think there were like four, four, four to six uh, turns that were like kind of up in the air, uh, where they could have shifted the games completely in my favor. And if I had made a different play in any of those turns, like I probably would have won one or two games in that set. But he just called me in every single uh, turn. Like uh, game one, I think there was I only had one real chance uh and then in game two i had like four or five chances where if i got one of those four or five turns right i probably won the game on the spot but he just called me right on every single turn and so um yeah he just got me so like i, I don't feel too bad about it uh obviously i would have preferred to win the regional but you know sometimes it happens um and it'll be a learning experience you know i gotta improve more uh to actually win the regional next time but um but any questions about the <laughs> no that's a that's a run. that's a yeah an incredible run congratulations again on uh getting top four with uh, such a creative team and uh i definitely encourage you to try it out this was a really uh really good guide to to how to use it um i definitely uh learned a lot definitely want to try this out because it is one of the cooler teams maybe maybe the only cool team perhaps to come out of this regional <laughs> uh perhaps uh and, <laughs> and so uh yeah so Again, rental code is on screen right now. The paste will be in the description down below. And uh, Michael, did you have any final words or shout outs that you wanted to give? Yeah, uh, I just want to say like, uh, this is like kind of uh, my, I don't know, like the the fruits of my labor for like almost a month. I think this is the most effort I've ever put into a team. Um, even more than like the one I ran at Stack or Portland, which I did put a lot of effort into those teams as well. But like, that's one I really, really grinded for. So I, I was super happy uh, that I ended up doing well with this team. Like, uh, especially because like coming into this tournament, I felt that it was a, a little bit of a, like a, a turning point or what do you call it? Like a fork in the road for me in terms of like uh, proving whether I'm a good player or not, I guess. Um, and I think, you know, I've always had like decent results, I guess, but um, really being able to get like another top cut under my belt, I feel like this weekend I proved that I am one of the better players in NA, best players in NA, if you want to put it that way. Um, and I'm going, like, I still have a lot to improve on, but you know, it's uh, the good step on my path there. Um, and then for shout outs, um, shout outs to uh, specifically like our, all the people who have supported me, like, you know, uh, there, there's been a ton of people, they, they know who they are, but uh, specifically for people who, who really believed in me for this team, uh, Alex, I, I worked with, um, he didn't have a, a, like a direct hand in working on me with this, but, you know, I talked with him a bunch about his ideas uh, of this team and 
Um, you know, he was part of the reason I've been so addicted to Pokemon recently, just like him winning Portland and stuff and moving to Seattle and, and being, um, like, you know, hanging out with him a lot more just meant that, um, like I was more locked in on Pokemon than I had been in the, in a long time. And so, um, you know, big shout outs to him and then big shout outs also to, uh, yeah, like Rajan and some of the other people who really believed in um the process and the the ideas that i came up with so um yeah couldn't have done it without like all the people who supported me along the way mm -hmm. absolutely well congratulations once again and thank you again for coming on the channel really appreciate it and uh yeah like i said try this team out it's super cool um but yeah until next time uh i will see you all later thank you for having me